This week, we're going to talk about the potential dangers of AI. They're not where you think. Yeah, and we're going to talk about how Web3 and blockchain could potentially be a solution for that. You're going to show us the inside peek at all the chat GPT-4 plugins. Yep, and Nova knows all about deal flow. So here we go, here we go. Yeah, uh. Here we go, here we go, it's the Web3 show. Before you know, it will be Web4, then Web5, Web6, Web7. But now it's Web3, so let's all go to heaven on a podcast here. This ish is the best. Learn and laugh with Travis and listen to Chris. Donna lives in the house with Verity and Nova. Talking about AI to help you get over. Yeah, like I said, it's the Web3 show. Now you know what you did, and so let's freaking go. What is going on? Yeah, so over the past couple of weeks, you've heard us talk about ChatGPT4. Well, check this out. What has happened with ChatGPT4 and plugins is going to blow your mind. What is going on? ChatGPT plugins. So just when you think everything is done with ChatGPT, what do they do? They come out with more stuff. So check this out. As it says right here, they're going to be implementing these to be able to do all kinds of specific things. Up-to-date information, so you can actually access the internet. You're going to run computations and third-party services. So now when you scroll down and look at some of this stuff here, and they talk about this here on openai.com slash blog, you can go there. So here are just some of the different uh, plugins. So you can actually just connect with Expedia, tell it what you want to do give you some plans. They're going to be able to create that stuff for you. Instacart, Kayak, Open Table, can book you a restaurant, Zapier. Now this right here is going to be ridiculous. Oh, what? This is so many different apps that you can play with, with this thing. Plus you can connect it. If you're a salesperson, you're going to be able to connect it to all these different apps. So ridiculous. What I want to suggest now is let's go ahead and play this video right here and watch what's going on with this because this is wild. What? So you mean to tell me that we can say, oh, I want to make this recipe. Oh, I don't have the food. And then, oh, ChatGPT4 can literally go out and order everything that I need. And that's just one use case. There's so much stuff this is going to be doing. This is mind blowing. I got to get out of here. This is going too fast. Very, very, very cool stuff. I mean, but this space is moving so fast. It's it's a really interesting time. And we're going to spend some time now bringing in Donald for a global perspective from Southeast Asia to join you and I. All right, it's time to welcome Donald Lim to join Travis and I as we talk about the potential dangers of AI. And they're not where you think. Donald, welcome to the show. Hi, hi, Chris. Hi, Travis. Always good to see you. We're doing things a little different this week. Instead of uh, having you just giving us a report, let's have a little little roundtable discussion about what's going on here with this AI explosion we're seeing and how can we maybe circumvent some of the potential problems that this could be creating. Yeah, at Misha Vinci, big shout out to her this week for putting an awesomely succinct but detailed tweet thread out on Twitter. You want to check that out. Um, and it really was the genesis of this conversation, Donald. We want a global perspective, uh, you know, from the East and the West on the dangers of AI and where they actually lie and where they where they don't lie, because there's a lot of potential in it, too. So, Travis, what were your opening thoughts on, on, on the tweet and the thread? What stood out to you the most? Well, there's several points I think that we could probably cover on this one. But one of the biggest challenges that I see personally with AI is that centralization of big tech being the ones that are creating these big sort of uh, large language learning models. And so I I think we got to somehow open this up because now we have Microsoft and, and Google, OpenAI is part of Microsoft now. Like that's a big potential danger, not only for bias, but for security, for a whole lot of things. Donald, what are your, what are your thoughts? Is this a concern uh, or is it still so new? Well, yeah, well, in our in our country, it's still very new. In fact, on our side of the world, uh, where where creativity is is a is a big factor. Uh, I just came from a creative summit uh, a, a week ago, and one of the big question mark is, will AI kill creativity? So I'm talking to uh, uh, songwriters, filmmakers, scriptwriters, and they're all, they're all there sitting in one room, and you have the tech people saying that no, tech will complement you. 
And I was the only speaker who said, no, AI will kill all of you, right? Because if you look at the, the, the fine arts, the artists, they don't have to create anymore. They just put everything into AI and come up with great work, right? The music, the songwriters, they don't even have to think anymore. They just put everything in AI and they came up with a, you know, a horde of lyrics that they can now mix, mix and match. Yeah, so, so, it's so true. You end up exactly. thinking like you're a creative genius. Like you type stuff, you type the right words in there. You're like, look at this amazing thing that I just created. Like, I, I am spectacular. <laughs> so I think you're right on with that right there, uh, Donald. What about what about human culture, Chris? What do you think about that? Because it seems like there could be some homogenization going on. Well, I think that, you know, the tie-in with what Donald was alluding to, and these are, these are the surface level concerns. So again, when we say the thing like where it's not where we think, it's actually in the business model design. It's actually in the incentive structures. And this is why Web3 matters. This is why we do this show. It's why we have to draw awareness to this stuff. But the quick history lesson is Web1 was about democratizing access to information and things that had been behind walled gardens, whether they were you know, establishments or institutions or whatever. They weren't available to the masses. And that promise still is exciting today. The challenge was is when we had the dot-com bubble, and web one was a read only web, which meant you really couldn't do much to interact with it other than just consume it, right? That was the early phase. <clears throat> we put all the information of the world up on the web and that was accessible, but there was no business model to support it. So when web two came out, it became a read write web, which is what we've all lived in. The platforms won. So at the beginning, the edge won. It was the users and the creators, but there was no way to monetize. There was no way to make money. And ultimately things ran out of money and they blew up. In web two, we advertised the snot out of things and we realized that we could weaponize these tools, these new data links, and we could see these companies become very profitable. The challenge is that's where we live today. So what are the impacts of that? <laughs> you have the homogenization of work of, of music, of culture already starting to happen because everyone shares the same Spotify account in a household. A lot of people share the same Netflix account until they start to to have done on that. And what happens is the algorithm starts to consume everybody's thing and starts to homogenize against that in a way where we don't necessarily notice it right away, but it but it normalizes things. Some of this is homogenization, but some of it is it's a blending of cultures. It's a past, present, and now as we're going into the future, there's a blend there. You know, as my daughter likes Led Zeppelin, that's one of her favorite bands, Pink Floyd. But then she also likes some of these new bands, right, that are that are that are big and heavy, and she loves to play bass. So I think creativity, in some ways, is not gonna go away, but they're gonna have to find new ways to express their creativity for profit and potentially. Here's the importance of Web three. What is Web three about? Web three is about bringing power out of the center. Because right now, five big tech companies in the West and three in the East basically run everything, right? And what AI does left unchecked, meaning if the business model doesn't change, if it's open source code, <clears throat> but you can put $10 billion at it, like Microsoft just did, and you can roll it out to 1.4 billion install base in your office apps, what happens isn't bad in the sense of productivity, but what happens is that one a uh, massive behemoth can now create an index that's proprietary, which is what Google did, by the way. Most people are like, how do you break up Google? It's got a monopoly on search. Well, you don't make it sell off YouTube or sell off its different parts, right? That doesn't break up the problem. The, the problem and what you have to open up is the index layer. That's where all the data that's been searched for the last 15 years is locked in a code. And it's why other search engines suck, quite frankly, because because of the sheer dominance of inputs going into Google for the last 15 years, and because that index is not open source, they have a bigger library of the intent and the relevance data on humanity than anyone else in the world. So if you were to force them to open that index up, their business doesn't change overnight. But what it allows someone to do is go, wait a minute, I'm going to build a better UX or a different search uh, experience on the front end on top of all this data that you've accumulated for the last 15 years, Google, mm -hmm. and that unlocks a whole new possibility in the world for people to innovate. The same thing must be true with ChatGPT. If we're gonna have ChatGPT be open source, which it is, that's great. We just have to make sure that- Which it was, it was. No, it's, it was. Still, it's still- Now it's owned by it Microsoft. There's still API <laughs> tap-ins, right? That we're still gonna be able to do with that. But a lot of times what's happening is companies are building cool stuff to tap into chat GPT four. And then, Oh, by the way, they just sort of usurp that. And now it's part of the, now it's part of the platform. 
So I do like what you're saying. I think that we got to open some of that up because there's this privacy and this data control that's going on right now. And the, and the, the, the Democrat, the democratization, democratization of, well, of those resources that we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, you know, what the dominant platform is, if it's Android or, or iOS in, in your world, but the, the reality is, is that in the world, none of us have an identity anymore. We have an Apple ID, which is Apple's yep. identity, which knows more about us and is more us than anything else we've experienced. Or we have a Google ID because those are basically the two choices when you go into your store and you buy a phone is log in with a Gmail or log in with an Apple ID. And you have to create one first. And the minute you do that, that free identity is harvesting us at levels that are unprecedented. And so even though Android is still open source, go try and use an Android phone that has been de -Googled won't work because all the way down to the chipset level, and I learned this by building a phone, by the way, all the way down to the chipset level, Google has put in their, their hooks so that as soon as you download one app from Google Play, it rewrites all the ports. So whatever security oh. you're looking for, whatever privacy or whatever self-sovereign ownership of your data you're trying to get can be undone with one click. And that has to be regulated. That's where the regulators should be putting their energy right now. Not on a small trillion dollar industry that is is creating a future of web three commerce and communities and, and direct peer to peer. They should be focused on the big right. tech entchantment in these chipsets, in these indexes mm. and say, before we unleash AI to the world, we better fix that. Otherwise we will all be gone in 10 years. Uh -huh. uh, let's ask that Donald. What do you think about this? Like is, is web three, the solution you think to, to help us with the dangers of AI? No, I think it's it's going to be a big uh, yes and no. Uh, we we see that right now the centralized world, Web two, is still dominating our country here, mostly in Asia. We're seeing that uh, like, like even China, South Korea, everything is still very centralized. You're seeing TikTok domin dominating here in the Philippines and many parts of the world. TikTok being a very controversial, very central Web two app, right? Uh, and everyone was pushing towards Web three, but again, Web three still offers no concrete solution. Right, where will you migrate all of these people consuming all of these content, creating your own? You, you're, if you're going to challenge uh, whether it's your uh, Apple ID or your Google email, uh, where do you go to? Right. So I think uh, Ethereum before, address, and, hopefully in the yeah, future. I mean, right? yeah. So you don't have, you know, most the, the majority of our of, of of the citizenry here is still going to use what is traditional, what is easy, what is there already, rather than migrate to to something that is truly yours. And you have the freedom to to operate, and you're not under any certain rule by any private enterprise. But I think that's still a long way off here. Yeah, and just to add to that, what I would say is that you know you're right. There's not a place or there's not a hub for everyone to go in the Web three world yet. It's not a perfect Web three world yet. We're not quite there. It's still kind of a Web two point five, maybe 5. Web two point seven five. Like we're we're getting there, and I think that. You know, but one of the biggest concerns about this whole thing is open AI being open enough for all of us to have access to those data sets. As Chris had referenced earlier, it's like you have these big technology companies that have 15 years of search data and all this data. We don't have access to any of that. That is not democratized, right? So that's some of the problems. And then now they're the ones that's creating the AI tools that's going to have a significant bias. If you believe that you know, the left-leaning tech side of things in the Western world, right, doesn't have a bias when they're building these platforms, then you're incorrect because there's certainly a bias in how those things are being programmed. And so for to us get to, to get access to those data points, to get access to that, what we're going to have to do is to really create our own sort of, you know, large language models, which Stanford recently did with their Llama platform. And they did it for 600 bucks. So we're not too far away, guys. Yeah, and I think, you know, what concerned consumers or what curious consumers, quite frankly, could do. They've all felt it, right? We've all felt it. We all worry about our kids with a phone or whatever the thing is. Can't put our finger on it. You know, go to Netflix. If you're going to watch Netflix, watch Social Dilemma. Watch Coded Bias. They're, they're movies you can watch. And they'll inform you. And you can't solve a problem you don't know what it is. So the first step would be, Donald, you know, to your point, Maybe there's nowhere to go and I can't trade out my email or my my operating system just yet, right? Yep. But what I can do is I can become informed. I can wake up a little bit. 
and I can start to make, I can start to think for myself. Might mm -hmm. be a good place to start. Yep. Well, well, one one consideration also is that if you look at Asia, where I came from, uh, there some countries don't have alphabets, right? So China, hmm. Korea, Japan are all character based, right? So even even then, AI would be a totally different play altogether, right? When they crawl the entire web or whatever, that's decentral decentralized hmm. web would be. That's actually really interesting. That's a whole other topic. I I, I couldn't even think about Travis like. You know what's a language? What's a natural language process model look like in character-generated languages? Right. Uh, uh, and we've said it every show. I think the world is changing, <laughs> and I would say that these last two weeks, folks, here with AI, and I'm talking the middle of March, 2023, the world shifted. It's such a large scale that it's almost Gutenberg press level shift that yeah. many. Many people are not even aware of with Chad GPT-4, with Midjourney 5, with Google announcing BARD and then they're implementing into all of their systems. And then, you know, Copilot with Microsoft. I mean, this is the AI arms race now. And then Baidu, I think they were launching something and there's some. So there's just a lot of stuff that's going on right now that you have to keep your finger on. You have to be paying attention to this because if not, AI will eat the world. And I'll tell you this, Chris. Microsoft is advancing so quickly, they fired their whole AI ethics team, right? And they're moving so quickly. They want to do, like, they were not supposed to release Chat GPT 4 so quickly. Microsoft pushed them to do it. So, what's going to happen when somebody, when these advance so far, and then somebody pushes something too quickly because they're in this AI arms race, and then you can't put that genie back in the bottle? Yeah. And that ties right back to the incentives models and needing to shift and and my call to action would be there's no better incentive than to activate 8 billion customers into a consumer cycle where they can actually earn and learn and prosper and we have to get off of this shareholder value at all costs model because it's what's driving those kind of moves right who do we we don't know but we can think that maybe the reason microsoft is going so fast is because it was their chance to leapfrog a, around Google after losing the mobile phone platform and losing the other things back in, you know, the early double O's. Mm -hmm. Now what's Google doing? Google's putting out barred fast and saying openly, it's probably not going to work that well in the beginning. Why are they doing that? Because it's, if they don't, right, then the, then people will move. And so mm -hmm. these incentives are kind of hard baked. They're hard to unbake. Um, but we can start to learn faster. We can start to educate faster. We start to make decisions with our spend as consumers and be more thoughtful. And ultimately that's what every one of these things will follow. So big, big, big episode, big segment, heavy stuff. Our best days, mm -hmm. I still believe are ahead of us, but, but not just by default, we have to really put in the work now. Cause we're all creative geniuses now. So yeah, that's smart. Right. Like with our that's right. well, you definitely AI are. skills. You definitely are. <laughs> Can you imagine when we get that neuro link tap into our brain, folks? Like, what? Oh, God, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, right. and well, that know, was <laughs> before there was a world where you have creative people and tech people, and now they're now fused together, right? You mm -hmm. you have to be, a, even if you're creative, you have to be a tech person and yeah. vice versa. What a conversation that was. Love having Donald on there, you and I, and Donald talking all the things. That was great. So next up, we want to know what Nova knows about the Web3 deal flow. So Nova, what do you know this week? There are many deals flowing. $458 million has been invested in blockchain gaming companies in 2023 so far. Hadian, metaverse company backed by Epic Games, raises $5 million. Hydra Ventures raises $10 million to fund other DAOs. Tommy raises $40 million for its DAO-governed alternative internet network. Perplexity AI raises $25 million to remake Search with AI. Fetch.ai raises $40 million from DWF Labs. Mystic Games raises $1.5 million to build out its upcoming title Call of the Void, its community, and its DAO structure. Back to you, Chris and Travis. Thanks, Nova. Every week, you and the team at EdgeIn keep us up to speed on all the money flows that are happening. We really appreciate it. That's all we got for this week, folks. Travis? Yep. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. We appreciate everybody tuning in. If you enjoy in the show, there's another one that you'll probably enjoy right there. If you like it, you might want to subscribe to it. And if you really like it, you might want to put a ring on it. <laughs> <laughs>